All right, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a multitude of topics that you can cover when you preach about the Bible. This morning, I just want to uh, talk about my position on the King James Bible and what I believe is a sound position of, you know, how we got the Bible, uh, why we can believe the King James Bible is the perfect Word of God. Um, but just some starting assumptions. So, you know, I'm going to be addressing that question today, what my position is on the King James Bible. I, I won't be addressing uh, necessarily in full, you know, why do I believe the Bible is the Word of God? Because that's a valid question. People will say, you know, well, you know, why do you believe the Bible? Why not the Quran or the Book of Mormon or some other writing from some saint or whatever or some writing from uh, some Buddhist teacher or something like that? Why, why do you believe that the Bible, as is uh, presented to us, the 66 books in the King James Bible, is the Word of God? So I'm not going to be talking about that. It, it's a sermon I'm preparing that I might talk about at a later date. Um, and so I'm just getting that one together. I'm also not going to address the question today of why do we use the King James Bible as opposed to all these other translations that are out there. You know, the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, the, the New King James Version, or the New English Translation. You know, they say there's all these translations out there of the, of the English Bible. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about that this morning, why I um, think the King James Bible is the one that we should be using out of all the different English translations out there. So I'm just going to start the assumption that uh, of people that do use the King James Bible, of people that uh, are what we know as in our circle as King James only. And we are a King James only church. You know, we, we only teach and preach from the King James Bible. And I hope that in the coming weeks or months as I cover these topics on the Bible, you'll start to get an understanding of why we're King James only and why we reject the other Bibles and why we reject other translations that have attempted to change and corrupt God's Word and have false doctrine in them and contradictions in them that a lot of people are not aware of. But of, 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 of King James only-ism, they call it, of people that are only King James only, there's a spectrum of, of people that are King James only. Because it's not just if you're King James only, there's just one position. And the positions that I'm aware of, if you start on the very liberal side and, 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 and not, not true in my opinion, you would start on one side. I don't know if I should do left or right. Maybe left, right? Because right should be the right position. But on one extreme, you've got people that believe, you know, well, the King James Bible is just one of many good translations in English. It's just, it's the same. It doesn't matter which translation you use. And the reason why they're King James only is maybe tradition or preference. You know, that was the Bible that they grew up with. That was the Bible that their parents used, that passed, passed on to them. Maybe they're just so comfortable using it that they're used to the language. Uh, and that's why they use the King James Bible. That's why they're King James only. So somebody that just thinks it's just one of the many translations. Then you've got the people that think, well, the King James Bible is the most faithful translation, but it's not perfect. It is inferior to what they call the original scriptures or the original handwritten manuscripts. Uh, and that's, that's the position of a lot of independent churches, um, to be honest. To, they, they, they get up and they say, you know, the Bible's the inerrant, infallible Word of God, and they're holding a King James Bible in their hand, and they say, you know, this is the infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of God, and, and, and that's what they say to you. But then when you ask them, do they actually believe that the book they're holding in their hand is the infallible, inerrant Word of God? They say, no, it's just the most faithful translation, you know, but, you know, for some reason they think it's all right to say that. It's all right to, to lie and, and, and not state their true position. Maybe because it sounds good, right? Because it looks good when you hold up the book that you're preaching from, that you're, you're saying is the Word of God, and you know, it, it's consistent with what you're teaching. But when you actually pin them down on it, they have that second position of, it's the most faithful translation, but if you want the real meaning, you've got to go back to the originals, you've got to go back to the original languages, and it's inferior to the original uh, writings. And then you have uh, the... Uh, another position. So you've got, it's just one of many translations, then you've got, you know, it's the most faithful translations but inferior to the original languages, and then you have that it's, a, that it's an accurate translation and it is equal to the originals. Now this is, this is my position. My position is, is that it is an accurate, 100% accurate translation into English and it is not inferior or superior 
to the originals. It is identical. So it doesn't matter whether you have it in English, you have it in Greek, you have it in Spanish, you have it in German. If they are all saying the same thing, then they're all equivalent. One is not better than the other. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't believe it. that's the only way it could be written. You know, the, the, the English Bible can be written in a more modern English. But I'm not going to go into that today of, of why I think the King James Bible, uh, why I use the King James Bible. Um, but, you know, when you have the position of it's accurate and it's equal to the originals, you, you don't need to go to another language. Um, so you can stay in the language that's your primary, primary tongue. Um, but also it's equally, it means it's equally authoritative. Uh, you know, if, if something is said in the, in the English Bible, it's as authoritative as something in another Bible of a different language because it should say the same thing, right? But the main question, the main objection you really need to overcome if you take the position that it's equal and or equally authoritative and not inferior or superior, it is equal to the originals, you sort of have to address the question, well, can a translation be perfect? Can a translation indeed be identical to the original because people have this frame of mind that a translation cannot be perfect and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the last position which is I think the extreme on the other side is that the King James Bible is an accurate translation but it's superior to the originals. And people uh, that you may have heard of, you know, Peter Ruckman, Sam Gipp, take this point of view that the King James is like a re almost like a re-inspiration of scripture. I don't know if that's how they would describe it but it's almost like the King James came along and that is the new, I guess, takes the place of the original manuscripts that everybody should be going to. So they think, you know, it was Hebrew in the Old Testament because that's the language that God's people spoke. And then it was Greek in the New Testament because that's the language that God's people spoke. And now everyone speaks English and, and God has raised up the King James Bible to be that standard. To the point where they believe if you truly want God's word, you have to learn English. So some people believe that where, where, the, old test, where the, uh, the original scriptures were, are the only ones that we should go to. They think you need to learn Greek and Hebrew. Whereas people on this last extreme, they believe that you have to even to the point, you have to learn English to get the real uh, word of God. And they believe it cannot be written in another way. So, you know, whosoever believeth must be whosoever believeth. It can't be anyone that believes, even though that's the exact same English words in a more modern English. Uh, which is what my position would be. So that's the spectrum of KJV only, and I would put myself in the camp of it's accurate and it is identical to the originals. Therefore, it's equally authoritative. And I'll just go through a couple of those things uh, as we uh, go through these scriptures here. Now, the first thing I just want to cover is, <clears throat> number one is God's word is eternal. God's word does not have a beginning. Because a lot of people think that God's word came into being at the time when it was written. And, the, and, the, and when they have that belief, they emphasize, well, they overemphasize, in my opinion, the original writings as though they are more special than any other copies or translations or of that same word. But let me show you a couple of scriptures here. Psalm 119, verse 160. The Bible says, Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So if you're familiar with Psalms, you know that Psalms 119 is a, is a, is a chapter of Psalms. And the whole chapter, the longest chapter in the Bible, is about God's Word. So you read through Psalm 119, and I can't remember how many verses there are in it. 176 verses, and all 176 verses have something to do with God's Word. I mean, look at the last verse. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Uh, and, and all of the verses, a lot of them are, are, are all like that. But we see here in, in, in verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning. So it wasn't true from the time it was written. Otherwise, how could it be true from the very beginning? And how could it be true if it didn't even exist? So you see, it didn't come into being when it was written. It came, in, it was always, it was eternal uh, it was from the beginning, and then we see there, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So we see it goes from everlasting uh, to everlasting. But let's look as well at Titus. Titus chapter 1. We see the introduction here to the letter to Titus from Paul. Uh, verse, starting from verse 2. Sorry if the highlights are a bit distracting. I, uh, the highlights are there for when I go out soul winning and uh, need to turn to them. 
Verse, uh, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. So that's how we know where we can have eternal life because God has promised it and he cannot lie. Uh, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So the promise of eternal life existed before the world even began. But look at verse 3. It continues the thought. But hath in due times, so at, at certain times throughout history, but hath in due times manifested or made known his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now this word preaching, we often think of what I'm doing now, right? You're preaching to a congregation. But preaching is just making something known with your mouth. That's why when we go and preach the gospel, we don't just preach gospel, the gospel at church. We go out and we preach the gospel to people because we're going out there and we're making known by speech uh, the word of God and the promises of God. But you see there how it links together but hath in due times manifested his word, it links it with the promises. So he, that which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So there's his promises, because where do we get God's promises? From his word. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So you can see there that the word existed before the scripture came along, it, because the promises existed before the world even began. But it was in due times that God manifested his word. So the word that already existed in the beginning was manifested through preaching as people spoke it. And eventually those words uh, were written down. And this is consistent with John 1 as well. It says there, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So a great verse for the Trinity there showing that you know, the word we know in uh, later on in verse 14, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word was in the beginning with God, but the word was God. And that's where we see the Trinity there. We see the Father, the word and the Holy Ghost. And, you know, a lot of people have the impression, and it's right, that the Trinity is the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, which is, which is true. But when we read in 1 John 5, 7, we see that the Trinity, we'll just turn there quickly. It says here, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So the Word is the second part of the Trinity. The Word became flesh, which was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was called the Son of God, we read in Luke, because he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Therefore that holy child which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So it's not wrong to think of the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's definitely true. Uh, the Bible also defines the Trinity as the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So the Word of God is not the ink on the pages, or as I'm seeing on my iPhone here, it's not the pixels on this screen. The Word of God is the Word that existed before, that, would, that created all things that we see uh, in John 1 here. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And that word became flesh 2,000 years ago. How that works, I have no idea. How, how words of God can become a man. I think it has something to do with the word being spirit and the spirit indwelling uh, the flesh of human, uh, of, of men. But you know, I haven't 100% I haven't figured that out yet. Um, but that word was in the beginning. It existed before the scriptures, but in due times, as we read in Titus, it manifested through preaching. And that word, 2,000 years ago, became flesh, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's one, the first point I wanted to make. God's word is eternal. So the inspired word, you've got to catch this, it existed before even language and before even writing. It existed. Because... People will say, well, if you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, it's perfect. They'll say, no, 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 because the King James Bible, you know, the Bible, uh, you know, it's a translation, it's a copy, blah, blah, blah. You have to go back to the original language. That's, that's where you get the real truth of God's Word. But with this in mind, if God's Word is eternal and existed before language, existed before the Scripture was even written, what language was it in? What lang then the question is, what language was the original? Because it wasn't Hebrew, 
That's just at that time how God manifested it through preaching. He manifested it in Hebrew because that was his people that he used to spread the word of God. But the word already existed. So what language was God's word in before languages existed? For example, what, what, what language did God say, let there be light? What language was that? Was that? Did he speak in Hebrew? Or, you know, you could assume that, but that's not something you can prove. Um, so we don't know. So it's... To me, it's not sound to believe you have to, go, you have to overemphasize these original languages, these original scriptures, because the word existed before language even existed. And you know, there are two, two religions that come to mind. Uh, let me just turn to 1 John 2. There are two religions that come to mind that have this philosophy, that have this philosophy of, you know, you can't read the God's word in your own language. You need me, who has studied the languages and studied the grammatical structures, to explain it to you, to tell you what it really means. Um, that's why you need the church. You need the church because you can't just read the Bible on your own at home. You, you're going to get misled and you're not going to understand it. That's why you need you know, bishops and you need to go to a man in a dress um, and, and, and get him to explain it to you. And it's funny because both these religions wear long robes. Um, but the two religions I'm thinking about is, is Islam and Catholicism. Islam and Catholicism have this philosophy where you can't read the Quran in English. And, and, and Muslims will say this to you. you know, even if you read the Quran in English, you're not getting the real meaning. You need to read it in the Arabic. That's why we need imams and we need teachers. You need to go to them because even if I explain it to you, I might be getting the wrong, you know, the wrong idea. You need to go to these teachers that have studied the languages, that know what it means, and they need to explain it to you. And this is what was happening in the, the Christian religion uh, during the Dark Ages where the Bible was in Latin and a lot of people were trying to translate God's Word into English and the Catholics were killing people trying to translate the Bible into other languages. Now I'm not condemning all people that identify themselves as Catholics because obviously the Catholic that lives down the road didn't kill anybody that was trying to translate God's Word into, into English. But I'm saying the Catholics as, a, and as an organization and, and the things that they were doing at that time, uh, they were uh, killing true believers that were trying to get God's word in their language. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say in terms of whether or not we need a man or not to teach us the truths from God's word? Let's look at 1 John 2 from verse 18. The Bible says here, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So the context here now in 1 John 2 is of deceivers, Antichrists that come denying the Lord Jesus, denying that he came in the flesh, wanting to seduce us. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now this verse is often used as an assurance of salvation, but you can see the context is Antichrist. So this doesn't mean if you quit church and you quit living the way God you know, wants you to live, that you're not saved, because it's saying, oh, you know, because if you were really of us, meaning saved, then you would continue with us. No, it's saying that it, it was made manifest, the Antichrist, that were denying the Lord Jesus, that were denying the truths of the Bible and trying to deceive people, they were made manifest and would no doubt have continued with them if they were of them. It says, but ye, so believers, but ye have an unction from the Holy One. Now an unction, I looked it up, it, it means that it's a, an anointing. And I, I believe that's supported by the scripture because we see the anointing later. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. So John here in, in this scripture that he was inspired to write is saying, you know, you have this anointing, you, you believers, my little children that he's writing to, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. So he's saying, I'm not writing these things because you don't know what the truth is, and I have to give you some revelation that can only come from me. He says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you. So these truths which ye have heard from the beginning, 
If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Talking about the truth. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. So he's saying, I'm writing these things because of these people that are trying to seduce and trick you. But the anointing, so there's that unction, but the anointing which you have received of him, which is the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is that anointing that we receive and abides in us. Which you have received of him abideth in you. And look at this. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So this idea of needing a man to teach... Now, does it benefit for a man to teach? Like, are you going to benefit today? I hope so. That you know, you'd benefit from being taught by somebody that may know a little bit more than you at this point in time. But do you need me to teach you? The scripture says here that if, you have the, if you're saved and you have the Holy Ghost living inside of you, the truth that the Holy Spirit speaks through his word can teach you all things. So that means there is nothing that you will learn today that you couldn't learn yourself just from reading God's word. And if there is something that you learn from me or you learn from a man that isn't clear in the Bible, you need to test that. You need to make sure that what you're being taught is true. So you don't need a man to teach you. And that's why there's this philosophy. And that's all that going back to the originals accomplishes. Because unless you speak Hebrew or you speak Greek, you're going to need some man to teach you. Because God can't just speak to you himself in a language that you speak and that you understand. So all it's doing, all I believe that position is doing is it's removing the Bible from you. And that's what Islam wants to do. They want to remove the Quran from the common Muslim. That's what Catholicism wants to do. You know, you speak to even Catholics today, they, they have this frame of mind that they can't just pick up the Bible, read it and understand it. They have, they're being taught and drummed into them that they need the bishops and the archbishops and the priests to teach them the Bible because they, don't, they haven't seen this verse that's telling them you don't need any man to teach you, you just need the Holy Ghost. Um, and all it's doing is it's taking away God's words from you. You know, you can have God's word in your hand and read them and all that's doing is taking it from you. And that's not God's will. God wants you to read it and study it and love it, learn it and obey it. So number one, God's word is eternal uh, and it existed before uh, languages, it existed before uh, writing. But number two, this, this word was, was spoken before it was written. So the Bible existed, the, the scriptures existed in a verbal form before they existed in written form. And we'll just go back to Titus there. Where we read, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So God didn't say here in Titus that he has manifested his word through writing. He manifested his word through preaching. And what I'm trying to get at here is this emphasis on the original writings. The emphasis is not on the original writings. The emphasis should be on what is the inspired word that existed before the world began that was manifested through preaching, which we have recorded for us in the writings of Scripture. But let me, let me show you this principle all throughout the Bible. Uh, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. Oh, that's not 2 Samuel. Samuel... 23, there we go. Verse 2, this is David speaking here. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. So David didn't say the spirit of the Lord moved me and his word was in my pen. He said the spirit of the Lord spake Spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Uh, look at uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, verse 9. This is Jeremiah now. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Uh, so again, the word is uh, spoken primarily, um, and those spoken words were written down. Now we see here in Numbers 23, Verse 12, 
Now this is Balaam uh, talking here, and obviously Balaam is not, was not a righteous prophet at all, but it's interesting that he says here in verse 12, and he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And we'll blow through a couple of these other verses. Look at this verse in Psalm 45, verse 1. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. Again, speech. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Now, isn't that interesting that he's saying that his tongue is like God's pen. So as God is writing out these words, David speaks them. And it's, it's, it's just interesting because we often use the analogy of you know, how can, you know, they say men pen down God's word, therefore it can, be, it can have errors. And we say, well, you know, when you write an essay, are you writing the essay or is the pen writing the essay? Well, the, pen, the pen's not writing the essay. You're writing the essay. You're just using the pen to write the essay. And it's almost like God is saying here, you know, is the man, is the man speaking or is God speaking? Well, God is actually using man as his pen to speak the words of God. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Uh, let's look at this uh, verse in Luke. This is, uh, you know, when Zacharias, I believe it's just after uh, the child, John the Baptist is born and then Zacharias is given back his speech because he was, it was taken away because he didn't believe the angel. It says here in verse 67, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So again, he see, you see there that the word was spoken uh, by prophets. Hebrews 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in, times, in time past, unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these day, last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So you see there that the Bible is spoken. And the last one that we'll go to is uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1. Let's read from verse 13. Yea, I think it meet. So it's, it's suitable. As long as, as I am in this tabernacle, so he's referring to his body as a, as a, as a tent, a tabernacle, to stir, up, stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So he's saying, I'm going to die soon, as Jesus Christ has revealed to me. I'm going to put off my tabernacle. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in, in remembrance. And just note that verse, because I'm going to come back to it a bit later. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. What is he referring to there? It's when uh, 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 Peter, James and John went up with Jesus Christ into the mount of transfiguration. And remember, Jesus was transfigured before them. And he's saying, you know, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. We were, verse 16, eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him get transfigured and we heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So let's stop there. I mean, you think what, you know, he, they, they were there in the mountain. They saw with their own eyes. They heard with their own ears. And you start to think, what could be more sure than your own experience? What could be more sure than something you see with your own eyes? And, you know, it reminds me of the Mormons that came and knocked on my door yesterday. And I asked them both, you know, why did you accept um, the Book of Mormon as the Word of God. And both of them said, you know, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed about it and they just had that feeling, you know, that burning in the bosom. They believe the Holy Ghost revealed it to them and now they just know that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. What are they saying? They're basing their belief on how they feel. They're basing their belief on experience. 
And a lot of Pentecostals, a lot of people in, in, in a lot of churches these days, that's what they do. They'll say, I, you know, I spoke in tongues. I experienced this. I felt that God was there. And, they, and they're basically basing their, their truth, their standard of truth on what they experienced. But what do we learn from the Bible? The Bible says here that they had that experience. They were in the holy mount. They heard the voice from heaven. But what do they say in verse 19? We have also a more sure word of prophecy. So something even more sure than their own experience is the scriptures, is, is the Bible. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day, um, day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not a secret. And look at this. And this is what I was getting to. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It didn't come because men wanted it to come across, uh, come to us. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see there that that's how we got the scriptures. The scriptures were given to us by God speaking through man. So a lot of people might have the objection, well, you know, man spoke God's word, so man can corrupt God's word. Well, that's not true, because what we see in the Bible is it wasn't actually man speaking what man wanted to speak. It was God speaking through man. Remember what David said? My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. God, you know, even though we are not Calvinist at all, we don't believe God controls everything that happens on this earth, but when he wants to, he can. And when it comes to delivering, copying and translating, preserving his word, I believe that he doesn't leave that up to chance. He makes sure, because he loves us. He wants us to have his word. So he's not going to let man corrupt it. So it wasn't man speaking, it was God speaking through man. So number one, the word was eternal. Number two, it was primarily spoken, not written. So this emphasis on the original writings is misplaced. The emphasis should be on the original word, that, was, that existed before the world even began. Now these spoken words were written down for us. I just wanted to show you in verse 15 here. Now even though I can't prove this point, so I can't prove that, you know, you know who can prove whether there are errors or not, but we can believe that they, there isn't errors because we can see what the will of God is through the writing of his, script, of his, of his word. Look at verse 15. It says here, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Now, the context there is Peter saying that he wants the people that he's writing to to, to, to have these things, to always have these things after he's gone. And I personally believe that this shows us the will of God, that God's will is for us to have his word even once it's preached and once the people that originally preached it have gone on to be with the Lord or whatever. And we can see this uh, in a couple of things. Let me show you here in Acts uh, 1, 15. Here's actually another verse that shows us that the Holy Ghost spake uh, by people. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. So we see there, the Holy Ghost, this is how the scripture came. It was spoken by the mouth of David, by the Holy Ghost. For he was numbered with us and attained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, a seldomer, that is to say, the field of blood. And look at this. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric, which means you know, office, his bishopric let another take. So we see there that the Bible was spoken by the Holy Ghost, but he didn't leave us without witness because he made sure it was written down for us so that we would have it after it was spoken. Look here in Job 19, uh, verse 23. Job saying here, and I, I believe Job is prophetically ex proclaiming the desire of God. He says, Oh, that my words were now written. 
Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were engraven, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. See, God's desire is that his word is uh, penned out. Deuteronomy uh, 31, 24 says here, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. So after Moses delivered the word of God to the Israelites, he wrote them down in a book. And that's the desire of God. Look here at uh, Jeremiah uh, 30, verse 2, or even verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, so this is the word that came to Jeremiah, and it was saying, right? Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. Uh, Revelation 21.5 And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So with those things in mind, we'll go to 2 Timothy 3. This is a pretty famous verse about the scripture. Uh, and and uh, mo usually the verse people put up on their website on why they believe the Bible is the word of God. But it says here, all scripture, verse 16, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, a lot of people will take that verse because I think there's two ways you could read that verse. And a lot of people will say, when they want to try and emphasize the original writings, they say all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And they say, well, scripture is something that's written. So what is inspired and given by God is the writings. It's the scripture is given by God. But you see, you can also read that verse and, and read it as, you know, all scripture. So the writings that we have are given by what was inspired from God, by the inspiration of God. Because we know that inspiration means to, to breathe out something. So is it saying that the writings are what are inspired by God? Which wouldn't even make sense because if something's spoken, how can you inspire something by speech when it's written? Or is it saying like what we've covered in the last couple of verses that the word was given by inspiration of God, meaning that God spoke it through his prophets and spoke it through, um, through holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that is where we get the written scripture. That is where, the, so the written scripture is the words that were spoken, written down for us. So uh, only the original uh, writings inspired? Well, I believe it's actually the original word that was inspired. That was then preached, you know, and that was written down. And that is what we have today uh, with us. Um, let me show you a couple of other interesting things. Uh, Second Peter. Uh, it says here, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So he's referring to Paul's letters, saying that they're written down. But, but look at this verse 16. This is interesting. He says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. It, isn't it interesting there, and I don't know if this is really, you know, don't, you don't have to take this as a huge point. I just think it's interesting that verse 16 says, as also in all his epistles speaking in them. It didn't say as in all in epistles writing in them of these things. To show that link there between the word being spoken and that spoken word being penned down, possibly. And you know what? I don't know if this is interesting to you as well, but uh, I don't know if you know that Paul didn't even actually write all his epistles. Uh, he, he spoke them, but look at, this is Romans 16 in the last chapter. It says, I, Tertius, who was an, a companion of Paul, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So a lot of people say, well, well Paul wrote Romans. Paul didn't actually write it. He spoke it. The words were given to him by God, but it was actually Tertius that wrote down Romans. And the point there is, you know, it doesn't matter who writes down the Word of God, who, who, writes, it, who writes it, it matters where it came from, because it doesn't even matter who spoke it, because we know that 
even unsaved people spoke the word of God in the Bible. You know, people that were false prophets, people that taught wrong things spoke the word of God. And also holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it matters not who writes it down and who speaks it, just that we have that inspired word with us in a, in a, in a form that we can, we can read. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, well, men, you know, men corrupted the word then when they wrote it down. But, you know, we can believe that men can't corrupt the word when they speak it. Why should we believe that men can corrupt the word when it's written down? I mean, God, if God is powerful enough to, to make men speak it and create the universe, why can't he make sure that his word is written down accurately for us? So number one, it's impossible to even prove that. It'd be impossible to, to even prove uh, whether it was corrupted or not. Um, to just make that statement, uh, to, to any written testament, because that objection would apply to anything that is written down. Because if a Muslim is going to say, well, men wrote down the Bible, therefore they corrupted it, well, men wrote down the Quran. Men wrote down the Buddhist scriptures. Men wrote down, you know, men wrote down everything. I mean, God, you know, if you're going to take the position that there's some God out there, he's only communicated us either through men or through the Bible. So it's not really a hard position to take. But we can see from these scriptures that it's God's will. It's God's will for us to have his word written down. Um, and, you know, God is completely capable of doing it. So I don't see why it would be an inconsistent position to believe that we can have a perfect uh, written down version of God's word um, with us today. So, you know, they were eternal. They were spoken. They were written down. And then they were copied. Uh, let's show you in Joshua 8, verse 30 here. <clears throat> then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And this is Joshua now. And he wrote, Joshua... He wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. So we can see here that the copying is already started. You know, Moses wrote down the law. Joshua is now copying it. But what's interesting here that Joshua doesn't copy it in secret. He copies it in the presence of everybody. So, you know, like the Bible says, you know, no, no prophecy of the scriptures, any private interpretation. No, none of this was done in secret. What Jesus did, the Bible says this thing was not done in a corner. It wasn't done in some far off place where nobody was watching, nobody knew. They're copying it in broad daylight where everybody can see, everybody can check it, everybody can verify it, that these are indeed the words of God. Um, look here in Deuteronomy uh, 17 verse 18. We see a command here to the king of Israel. It says, it, should, it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. So we can see that the copy that the king is meant to make is not some secret book that nobody has access to. I mean, this is the book that the Levites used. It was used in the temple. It was used when it was spoken and preached and read. Uh, this, this is not a secret, this, 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 this word of God. But this is what people will say, right? People will say, you know, only, they'll say only the originals can be inspired and can be imperfect because you don't have this word. You just have a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and that can contain errors. But I want to show you, I want to do this illustration. I want to show you that this, this is not... The fact that you have many, many copies that are done in public, it actually verifies that you have the true original. Um, because a lot of people will say, you know, it's like Chinese whispers, right? It's, it's like Chinese whispers. And, you know, you know Chinese whispers as you copy and you copy and you copy. The message is going to get changed. The message is going to dilute and, and whatever. And, and people aren't going to get the real meanings. So what I wanted to do today is um, I wanted us to play a game of Chinese whispers. And uh, just, just as an illustration, and hopefully this helps you to remember this illustration. But um, the way we'll do it, and let me just... Um, freeze. 
All right, let me just freeze that. And what I'll do is I'll get, um, maybe I'll get um, Gershon, if you want to come up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to give, the way we play Chinese whispers, right, is you, you get a phrase, and the, the rules are you have to whisper it to the next person, and you only get to say it once, right? So you whisper it, only say it once, but I'm just going to put a disclaimer. There's no profanity in it, all right? So if you think you hear profanity, you've heard the wrong word. So please don't repeat profanity, Michael, when you get to say it up front here. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll give you the phrase so you can read it, right? And then you'll whisper it to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, to Christine, to Madeline, to Lala. Hopefully you guys want to be involved too, so just whisper it along to those guys. And then Ricky's going to whisper it to Michael, okay? And then Michael's going to say the phrase and then I'll show you what the phrase is. Okay? That's the phrase. Okay, so take as long as you want to memorize it, and then I want you to say it to Elizabeth. Now, now hopefully this works. Hope, hopefully it does dilute, but if it doesn't, then it still just proves my point that Chinese whispers doesn't change the word of God. No, no, you, you only get to say it once. Oh, okay. Now, Elizabeth, now you have to, you have to say it to Chris, Christina. All right, to, to, to Madeline. Doesn't it? Just say what you think you think it was. It, this is the whole point of Chinese whispers. The whole point of Chinese whispers is you just hear what you hear and you just say what you think it is to the next person. I'm, I'm interested to see what Michael says. <laughs> Do you want to? Do, do you guys want to play as well? Ah, okay. Yeah. Just go to go to Christine. Doesn't matter. Just either of them. <laughs> I think it normally does. All right, Michael. All right, with a loud, with a loud voice, just say what you think the phrase is. Peter. <laughs> now Gershon's already laughing because he knows what the phrase is. So we started off with a phrase. We went through chi Chinese whispers. I don't know if Chinese whispers. See, I can say Chinese whispers because I'm not, it's not being racist, right? Because I'm Chinese. Chinese or the tele the people call it the telephone game. Maybe that's the political correct way of calling it. The telephone game. Um, we started off with a phrase. You know, we, we went through. Nobody could verify what it says. And we ended up with the phrase, Peter. Now that's obviously wrong because it's a phrase. But let me show you what the original phrase was. A million monkeys sat down and typed Shakespeare. So a lot of people... So what's my point here? A lot of people say that, oh, you know, the copying of the Bible is like Chinese whispers. But is that, is that how it's really done? Is that a true analogy? It's a false analogy. Because that is not how copies are done. Because think about Chinese whispers. Number one, you can only say it once. And if Elizabeth misheard it, she couldn't verify with Gershon what the phrase was. Then when Elizabeth passed it to Christine, Christine couldn't verify with Elizabeth, nor could she verify it with Gershon. Nor could they verify it with what is on this screen here. And as you go on, it, it starts to change, it starts to lose meaning until it's something totally that it shouldn't be. And people are trying to use this analogy to say, oh, you know, that's how the Bible's copied and copied and copied. No, the analogy of how the Bible is copied is more like this. 
Everyone see the phrase? Everyone know what the phrase is? And it's, it, we're not going to do this, but let's say I said, everyone write the phrase down. Write the phrase down in your phone. You can cross check amongst everybody. Make sure you've got it looking exactly like how that looks. Punct you know, let's say punctuation, spelling, capitalization, the grammar, which is actually wrong because there's a quote mark here and there's not a quote mark in front. So we would get that too, right? We would copy it exactly. And once everybody's got it, everybody's copied it and verified it with each other, with the original, now we get rid of the original. Now the original is destroyed, it's, too, it's worn out, it's gone. Does it even matter anymore? Does it even matter when, you know, it, when everybody's got a copy of it that was verified with the original, could be verified with each other, um, that the apostles who wrote it could verify it? It doesn't get more diluted the more you copy it. The more you copy something, the more verified it becomes. Because the more copies of a writing that is out there, the more sure you are that that is what was in the original. Do you see? That's why, we take them, that's why they take the majority text. Because it's going to be the minority that are trying to change it, trying to twist God's word. And we know where it's wrong because it doesn't line up with every other scripture that's out there. That's why, you know, I don't, I don't mind acknowledging that the Book of Mormon is what Joseph Smith wrote. It probably was, because if they copied it and copied it and copied it, that's probably why it says what it says, because that's what he received from the angel Moroni, which we don't believe was. And it's the same with the Quran. They got it from the angel Gabriel, but it's probably an accurate copy, because like, like we showed there, it's not like Chinese whispers. As you copy and copy and copy something, it becomes more and more verified and you know the more copies you have, the harder it is actually to corrupt it. Because let's say we all had that written in our phones, exactly how it was, and then somebody tried to come along saying, no, this is what it actually says. Well, you could check with everybody and see where it's wrong, where it's been changed, and know whether to throw it out or not. So I hope, I hope that, I think that worked out well. I hope that helps you to show you that a copy c can stay perfect. But even, the, even, even without that, right? Look at these verses in the Bible. Because we actually have examples in the Bible of Scripture that were copies. And they're in the Bible. I didn't know if you know this. Look at this, Ezra. This is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him. Even unto Artaxerxes the king, thy servants, the men on this side of the river, at, and at such a time. So was this chapter of Ezra, was this the original? It was a copy, but it's in the Bible, and we believe it's inspired writing. There's a couple of others in Ezra, Ezra 5, verse 6. The copy of the letter that Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and Shethar Bosnai and his companions, the Aphasakites, which were on the side of the river, sent unto Darius the king. Again, a copy of the letter. Ezra 7, 11. Now this is the copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So in Ezra, we already see three examples of scripture that's in our, in our Bible that is not the original. It's a copy of it. And check out this one, Proverbs 25. We, we often believe that all the Proverbs were written by Solomon they weren't all done by Solomon. There were some Proverbs that were done that weren't attributed to Solomon. He's attributed to the book of, uh, of Proverbs. But look at that first verse in chapter 25. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. So Proverbs 25 is not actually the original writings of Solomon. Hezekiah was a king hundreds of years later. His men copied out the Proverbs of Solomon, and that's where we get chapter 25 of Proverbs. So this idea that a copy cannot remain perfect, you know, I can't prove, obviously, that the copies are perfect, but all I'm saying here is, is that if we believe the Word of God, it's not an inconsistent position to believe that a copy can be perfect, because there are copies in the Bible that are what we believe to be perfect. So it's totally a consistent position, and in fact, it would be an inconsistent position if you believed the Bible is the Word of God, and you didn't believe a copy could be inspired scripture because we have examples in the Bible. So it's eternal, it was spoken, it was written down, it was copied, 
And number five, it was translated. Now, this is, this is the most important point because a lot of people say, well, the King James Bible, it's in English, and if you have to translate something from another language, you're always going to lose meaning. And that's why we have to go back to the originals um, to get the true meaning of, of what God really wanted to tell us. Um, but does that line up with Scripture? Acts 2. The day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if man translates something, can something be lost in the translation? Possibly. Just like if man spoke something, or if man wrote it down, or if man copied it. Um, but let me ask you, what if, what if God himself was doing the translating? We see here that at the day of Pentecost, when God gave them the gift of other languages, it wasn't them speaking. It says, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So if God is the one doing the translating, why can't it be perfect? Isn't that a consistent position? Like if I was speaking to you in Chinese up here, and I had Jesus Christ himself standing here, you guys all had headsets on, and he was translating it to you in English. Do you think he would lose any of the meaning? I mean, a perfect translator could translate something perfectly and convey those words in that language as they should be conveyed. And I believe that's what we have in the English Bible. It is possible. If God does the translating, it doesn't need to lose any meaning. But let me show you a couple of verses in the Bible where we actually see translations in the Bible and they're inspired scripture. Um, verse uh, 40 of Acts 21. We see here... Paul is, uh, you know, taken by the centurion because the Jews want to kill him, right? And he asks if he can say a couple of things to the people. Verse 39, but Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So he's saying to the centurion, just, you know, I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm a citizen of this country. Let me say some things to these people, to the Jews, right? Because the Jews speak in Hebrew. Verse 40, and when he had given him license, so when the centurion allowed him to do that, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people, saying, you know, hush, hush. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying. And then it goes on in chapter 22, all the things that he said to the Hebrews. Now let me ask you this, what language was the New Testament written in? Greek. What language was Paul speaking? Hebrew. So... Even if you emphasize the original scriptures, you see here that the original scriptures was a translation of what was actually spoken. So is it perfect? Well, if we believe it is, why do we have a problem with believing that a translation can't be perfect? There's a translation here, he's speaking in Hebrew, and it's translated to Greek to be written down. What's my position? My position is they're both perfect. You know, you don't lose any meaning. The Greek and the Hebrew are both perfect. Uh, Genesis 42. So if you're keeping up with the Bible reading, you would have read past this as well. I won't read it all for sake of time, but when we see here in uh, Genesis 42 verse 23, we know the story that his brethren came from uh, Canaan to Egypt to, 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 to buy, uh, buy grain in the famine. And remember, Joseph hid himself from them. He pretended that he was an Egyptian. He spoke to them in, e e in the Egyptian language. And look at what it says here. Verse 23. And they knew not that Joseph understood them because they were speaking Hebrew. So Joseph knew what they were saying because obviously he's an Israelite. Jo that Joseph understood them for he spake unto them by an interpreter. Now, a couple of questions there is, Joseph was speaking Egyptian. But the Old Testament was written in what? Hebrew. And so, so the question is, what was, it, what was inspired? Was it what Joseph said in Egyptian? 
Was it what the translator said in Hebrew? Or was it what was written down in Hebrew? Was it originally written down in Hebrew? Or was it originally written down in, e in Egyptian and then translated over into Hebrew? Who knows, right? But you have this conundrum if you, don't, if you believe one over the other. But if we believe that, hey, God in his, his, his infinite knowledge and power was able to deliver his word, preserve it, have it written down, it doesn't matter which language it was in. Even if it's now, it's in English. It's still the inspired word of God. Um, here's another example, Daniel. This is a letter written from King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. So I guess the originals were Hebrew, right? That was collected in the Bible. But the original letter, what language was that written in? It was written here in every language. All, all people, all nations, all languages that dwell in all the earth. And just the last one I'll show you in uh, Jude. It says here in verse uh, 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, what language was he speaking? This is before the Tower of Babel. So what language was he speaking when he said these words? But we have Jude here writing them in Greek. So again, we see a translation in the Word of God, and we, believe, we can believe it's perfect because it's the Word of God. Why can't we believe that a translation can be perfect? So what I'm trying to show you here is that the presupposition that a tr you always lose meaning in a translation is, is false, and it can be demonstrably shown to be false because God can translate and he speaks all languages and he can translate perfectly. So, you know, it was, it, it was uh, uh, eternal, but it was spoken, it was written, it was copied, we, they tr God translated it for us. And the last point is, is he preserved it for us. And we'll just jump to a couple of verses quickly there. God made sure of it that his word would be preserved so that we would have it in our hand today. Uh, verse 6 and 7 of Psalm 12, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, them being the words of God. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So we can see there that God has promised that he will keep them. It's not up to us to preserve the word of God and to make sure of it. I mean, we can take part in that, be used of God, but God ultimately is the one who is going to preserve his word and make sure that it is with us today. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And did you know that this phrase is in Matthew, Mark and Luke and written the exact same way? You know, it's uh, Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, 33, exact same, heaven and earth shall pass away. I think the only difference is, I think it's a semicolon after the away. But my words shall not pass away. Uh, Isaiah 59, this is God saying to Isaiah, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. So this is a promise from God. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth, so again the speaking of God's word, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth, so from this time it's given to you, and forever. So you see there that we will always have God's word with us, we'll always have Isaiah's words, and we'll always have I believe we can extend that to every word of God that is pure, that's preserved for us. So, you know, the Bible, when, when they say, you know, it is written, they say it is written, meaning it had to be written at the point that they said that. 
The Bible doesn't use the words it was written as though it existed at some point in time in the past. It says it is written, you know, in Timothy 3.15, 1 Timothy 3.15, we see all scripture is given by inspiration uh, by God and is profitable, present tense. It's not that it was profitable when the people who had it had it. It's profitable now because we still have it. And even Jesus, when he walked this earth, said it is written when he was talking to Satan because it was written at his time. It was there at his time as well. So it's something that we have today. So I want to just finish on one chapter, uh, Jeremiah 36. And just read through this story with you because I... I think this is a really interesting story in Jeremiah 36 because I believe it covers all these principles that I've just been talking about and sh actually shows you an example of it taking place in uh, Jeremiah. Just let me get a drink of water. <clears throat> Jeremiah 36. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that, his, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, so you see that, spoken, take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee from the days of Josiah even unto this day. So there we see the word that's delivered to Jeremiah and he's asking him to write it down. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. So did Jeremiah write the book of Jeremiah? No, his servant Baruch wrote it from the mouth of Jeremiah. So we see there that the word came from God, it was spoken by Jeremiah, and men penned it down. Does it matter whether Jeremiah penned it down or not? Does it make it any less the word of God? No. Baruch wrote it down. It's still the word of God. Verse 6, Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. So that's why, you know, that's one reason why we read the word of God in church, because you know, God wants his word written, read in the house of the Lord. It may be they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return everyone from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against this people. And Baruch the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book, of the, uh, book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. And you know, that's what happens in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. When God's word is read, when God's word is preached, when God's word is taught, people will change. People will be moved by the Holy Ghost and their life will change if God's word is being preached. But often when you go to churches on Sunday morning, God's word is not being preached. You know, you, you get up and somebody gets up and tells you, you know, that God loves you and he does, right? And Jesus loves you and gives you a pat on the back, tells you how hard life is, but, you know, God is going to be there for you. And that's what you hear every Sunday. Or you go to church on Sunday morning and you just hear the gospel, the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation. How many different analogies of the plan of salvation can be taught on Sundays before you stop growing as a Christian? So that's why at this church, you might be thinking, oh man, he's preaching for a long time and he's preaching all this deep stuff. Well, it's because I want you to be solidified in your faith. I want to preach the word of God because I know that if God's word is preached and taught, hey, you're going to go away strengthened in your faith and there's going to be change there. Um, then read Baruch in the, in, the, in the book, the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court of the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house in the ears of all the people. Um, let's just skip down for sake of time to verse 17. <clears throat> it says here, so he's reading, he's going down, he's taking the scroll and he's reading it to all the people. Uh, and then they hear it in the house of the Lord and they say, oh, you know, well, come say to us, we want to hear all the words too, these servants of the king. And then it says here, and they, and they 
uh, verse 17, and they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? How, where did you get these words? Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. And you know, that's how simple it is. You know, people try and, you know, we don't want to complicate how we got with God's word. It's like, how did we get it? Well, God gave it to Jeremiah, Jeremiah spoke it, and Baruch wrote it down with ink in a book. Very simple. Uh, verse 23, let's jump down to there. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read, so Jehudai is a servant of the king. Now he's bringing this book of Jeremiah to the king to read it before the king uh, of Jerusalem. That when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the, in the fire that was on the hearth. So here we see the original writing of Jeremiah is now thrown into a fire. So do you think God is really fussed with the originals? He doesn't care, it doesn't matter to him whether the original writings were there or not. And why? Because we see later on, in verse 27, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burned the roll, and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had, hath burned. So God is not, is not fussed with people destroying the originals. Why? Because he's powerful enough to give it again. And, and he can give it again as many times as he needs to to make sure that we have God's word. And then we read here at the end of the chapter, verse, uh, verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another scroll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. So again, even when the word is penned down again, it's still done the same way. It is Baruch writing down the words of what Jeremiah is speaking from God. And there were added besides unto them many like words. And then that's the history of the book of Jeremiah. The original writings to the king that were burnt, then it was done again and more words were added to it. So we see there in that story, you know, how God's word was delivered, how God's word is spoken, how God's word is written down. We saw, you know, how God's word is spread, right? Because people will take it and preach it. Um, we see how that the preservation of the originals is a non-issue. It's, it's not an issue because God can, can easily give his word again. Uh, we can see that when God's word is preached in the house of God, um, that there are changes that take place in people's lives. And you know, those that reject the word of God will face judgment. We didn't read those verses oh, because I was planning to read the whole thing. But when uh, the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, threw it in the fire, God is saying, because you've rejected basically the word, God is bringing judgment onto Judah. Um, so those that reject the word of God will face judgment. And you have to understand the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. You know, the old covenant, if they rejected God's word, judgment would come on them. How that applies to us in the New Testament is if you reject salvation, you will face God's judgment. But if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you accept him as your savior, you will not face judgment. It's not, we can't misapply these verses and say if it's a believer not living right, that God will bring the judgment, the fire, the wrath, and the cursing on them. Um, that is not part of the New Testament covenant. So let's just recap again. So the word existed eternally. It was then spoken before it was written. It was written down for us. It was copied. We can see that copies can remain perfect. It was translated. We can see that translations can be perfect. And we believe that God has supernaturally preserved his word. So I have no problem at all believing that the King James Bible that we have today is the perfect word of God. But what's the point of this sermon this morning? The point of this sermon is so that you'll believe it. You know, so that when you read the word of God and you read the book that you have in your hand, that you're not second guessing it. You're not thinking, is that, you know, like Satan? Yea, hath God said? You're not thinking, did God really say this? You're not thinking... You know, I need somebody to explain this to me. You can't just read it and God will speak to you directly. So that when you read the word of God in your private time, wherever you read it, that you'll believe it. That you won't doubt it, you'll believe it. And then therefore you can follow it and you can let God speak to you. So I hope that was a blessing to you. I hope that taught you a bit about my position.